So I believe that this represents God having taken upon him humanity that is to be judged. And then that judgment, judgment happens, covered by the blood. One thing that I, I thought of just as I was preparing the notes for the session today uh, here in Tabor, it says in uh, 1 Peter chapter 4, and maybe I should have <clears throat> shared this in the first session, so it says in 1 Peter chapter 4, I think I've got a, a wire somewhere that's not supposed to be. It says, if, it talks about the gifts in the church. It says, as every man has received the gift, even so minister the same one to another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. And it says, if any man speak, let him speak as the oracles of God. And um, the holy of holies where God was, you know, in essence dwelling. Later on, when God, when Solomon rebuilt the tabernacle into the temple, then that inner Holy of Holies was called the Oracle, <clears throat> which basically just means the place where God would speak to us. So Moses would go in and have a conversation with God. And so when the Scripture says that when we're preaching the word of God, that we can preach it, it says, let him speak as the oracles of God. And so that to me is, is amazing, the fact that just like when, if Moses would go into and have a conversation with God and come back out and says, look and hear what God has to say, in the same way when we're reading our Bibles, and we're going and sharing the things that we're learning out of the Word of God that we can say it's just like we had a sit down with God and God spoke when we're preaching the Bible, obviously. And um, it made me actually think I should have written down the verses, but it made me think of uh, Second Peter. <clears throat> We know the story when, when the disciples were gathered and then Moses and Elijah appeared in the, the, at the Mount of Transfiguration with Jesus. And then Peter says, For we received from God the Father honor and glory when there came such a voice to him from the excellent glory, saying, this is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. And it says, In this voice which came from heaven we heard when we were with him in the holy mount. And then, you know, if we, we, might, we might feel like, if I had that opportunity, if I had that, that experience to sit there and see Moses and Elijah appear before Jesus and then God from heaven says you know Moses and Elijah disappear and Jesus is left and God says this is my son listen to him we might think why can't we have that experience or maybe if the unbelieving world could see something like that then they would believe but the Bible goes on to say that in verse 19 it says we have also a more sure word of prophecy whereunto you do well that ye take heed of as unto a light that shines in a dark place until the day dawn and the day star, day star arise in your hearts. So he's saying something, we have something much more valuable, much more authoritative, much more sh sure than, than that type of experience. God actually speaking from heaven, saying something. We have something that is even more precious than that. And he goes on to explain, knowing this first, that no prophecy of the Scripture is of, it, of any private interpretation, for the prophecy came not by 
in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. So when we're reading our Bibles, we're supposed to count that as more valuable and more authoritative than an actual angelic being or God himself saying, I have something to say. So I think we should look at our Bibles a lot more valuable in that way that God has, has spoken. And like it says in Hebrews, God in time past spoke to us by through all the prophets, but in these last days has spoken unto us by his Son, right? The final prophet, the final priest has spoken. It's done. Probably the strongest passage in Scripture to say that we don't need another prophet to come like a Muhammad or um, Ellen G. White or Joseph Smith, right? He said, we had prophets, because they will use that. They'll say, well, just like there always were prophets for a time, Jesus was a prophet for a time, but they would neglect to see what's written in Hebrews that in these last days has finally spoken to our son, through his son. So, in the last session, we talked about the Day of Atonement and the high priest in his all-white attire and going back into the holy place and coming back out again dressed in this garment <clears throat> of colors. So there's just a close-up view of, of this little guy laying here all lonely and needing a clothes washed, I think, getting dusty. So it's a, a lot of symbolism here in this model, in the, in the instructions that God gave to Moses regarding the daily work of the high priest. Children, what colors do we see here? Yeah. Do we think that there might be a reason why God started with white and blue and then put red over top of the white and blue? What does, what does red represent? Sin. That's right, sin and blood. So we can see this too, that white and blue represents holy, righteousness, supreme God, and then made to be sin, covered by sin, shed over him again. So again, a beautiful, small picture of the gospel, even, even there. And then we have what's called the breastplate of judgment. So on this breastplate, we have the 12 stones that represented the 12 tribes of Israel. And when you think about the 12 tribes of Israel, what comes to my mind is that God on his heart had all of his people. At that time, it would have been the 12 tribes. We know that according to Ephesians chapter 2, it says, Wherefore, remember that ye being in time past Gentiles in the flesh, who are called uncircumcision by that which is called the circumcision in the flesh made by hands, that at that time ye were, or we were all without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now, in Christ Jesus, ye who sometimes were afar off are made nigh by the blood of Christ. I'm not saying that we are now spiritual Israel, but God had his heart after the people of Israel, and we now have been blessed to be part of that, of his people. Like it says in John 1.12, but as many as received him, to them gave he the power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe in his name. Romans 2, 28-29, for he is not a Jew which is one outwardly, neither is that circumcision which is outward in the flesh, but he is a Jew which is one inwardly, 
in circumcision is that of the heart, in the spirit, and not in the letter, whose praise is not of men, but of God. So Paul wrote this to Jews that were proud to call themselves Jews, but not doing what God had planned for them to do. And he's saying, you can't boast in your genealogy. You can't boast that you're in this tribe or that tribe. You have to be, your heart has to be after God. So we have this breastplate. It's called a breastplate of judgment because the high priest on a daily basis was supposed to judge right and wrong in the camp and make offer animal sacrifices accordingly, right? And I talked a little bit about the Urim and Thummim. So the high priest behind the breastplate of judgment had these two stones, a black and white stone, and when a matter became too hard for him to judge, then he would reach in and, and God would, would cause the right stone to go into his hand to say, righteous or not, judged or not judged. And then that's the, the, what, would, what would decide that fact. So God decides what is righteous and what is not. And this standard of righteousness and unrighteousness crosses all cultural boundaries. God's righteousness is the same in one tribe and the other tribe exactly the same. So God's standard of morality across the globe is the same way. <clears throat> and then on top of on top of his shoulders they have these engraved stones. Now before I actually talk about that, um, there's a new material in here. We saw it when we were when I showed some pictures in the Holy of Holies and that is gold. So there's some gold in the garments as well. And gold is, is an interesting material. Um, when you even just go on Google and you research the origin of silver, the origin of brass, the origin, and you can start typing all sorts of different materials, you can find some explanation. Some, this is created when over time this and such and so, and so on and so forth. But when you do that same search, and I, I'm not saying that a sermon is, should be based on Google's research. <laughs> I actually had a debate with ChatGTP the other day. I asked ChatGTP to explain to me the origins of the universe, and we had a very interesting conversation. And, and, and after a while, ChatGTP said, well, there's, there's a common misconception between the, 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 the origin of life on Earth compared to the origin of life in general. So try to say that even though you think you have an explanation for Earth, I'm talking about way before then. And then began to talk about this energy that would have one time been, and then all of a sudden exploded. And then I asked where that energy came from. It's very interesting. You should do that. You can actually learn how to debate using chat GTP. So I was really encouraged after leaving that because... There was no foundations given, no proofs of any sort, just all sorts of guesses and hypotheses. But anyway, when you do a research on, on gold, I just wrote down a few quotes. I could have gone on and on, but one of them said, gold is believed to have originated during the process known as the supernova nucleosynthesis. Can you read that? So occurring when the stars imploded, Okay. And another quote said, there is no naturally occurring process that produces new gold on earth. The process by which gold is created takes place among the stars, is the thought. Like this, these are scientists of today. So various theories exist, but all think it has some origin far before anything existed, unlike the other metals. And I, I kind of, I read that and I was like, really? So they're not even attempting to say that there is some scientific process. And then I thought it was pretty interesting that in Genesis chapter 2, right after God created, it says, the name of that first, the river is Pison, that which, is, which compasses the whole land of Havilah. And it says, where there is gold and that gold is in that land is very good. 
So the Bible just says that it was there, that right at creation, God created that gold. And so when we think of gold then, in that light, it starts making sense that that gold so many times is looked at as, as in, a, in some way, as part of deity, as, as God-like. All these other graven images and altars that they had bound down to, so many times these statues of gold because they believed that gold represented eternity. It's always been and always will be. Gold cannot disappear like other things might change. Gold cannot so in that light, I'd like you guys to just keep that in mind that gold, in a way, represents e- eternity. So Aaron, on these, we'll use Aaron as a high priest as an example here. He had these golden tashes and this golden chain and the golden ring. And on top of that tash of gold, there were these stones that again had the 12 tribes of Israel engraved into those stones. So this, the work of the high priest in, 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 in enlightening our Jesus as our high priest, it's like we're saying not, not only does our high priest, our Jesus, have all the people of this world on his heart, all of his children there, he's carrying them on, on his heart, in his bosom, but he's also carrying the burden on his shoulders that he's thinking of them on his heart and he's carrying, he's carrying their load. It says in Psalm 55, 22, Cast thy burden upon the Lord and he shall sustain thee. He shall never suffer thy righteous to be moved. And then the plate of gold on the forehead. This model doesn't have it. I'd like to 3D print a better crown. But in that crown on the man, on, in the mantle, it has it's written holiness to the Lord. So when the high priest had this garment garment on and put that crown on, then what he was supposed to be thinking about was my job is solely and only to do the will of my Father in heaven. Just like Jesus when he said those same words, my will is to do him that sent me, and only, only his will. And then at the hem of the blue garment, we have these pomegranates. Pomegranates of blue, purple, and scarlet. And then, obviously, the bells as well. And it says here in Exodus 28, and beneath upon the hem thou shalt make pomegranates of blue and of purple and of scarlet, round about the hem thereof, and bells of gold between them round about. A golden bell and a pomegranate. A golden bell and a pomegranate. Upon the hem of the robe around about, and it shall be upon Aaron to minister and his sound shall be heard when he goes in unto the holy place before the Lord, and when he comes out, that he dies not. So the high priest had to have these bells, and the thought is, anyone coming into here that's not worthy will be struck dead. So the bells were both to give comfort to the people listening that all will be well because he has done the sacrifices that he needed for himself and others. He's cleansed himself. He's prepared himself. He's examined his heart. So he's going to minister, and it's going to be accepted. So as I was looking at those those colors, I was thinking about the... I was trying to understand why, again, specific colors, blue, purple, red, and bells in between each one, right? And if I was in the high priest position and having to put that garment on. And if I'm right to say that blue represents God's holiness and his expectation to obey God's commands, his commands, and if purple represents royalty, which I believe it does, being honored, lifted up as a king, and if red represents sin, which it does, 
then I would be, I just look at that in a very practical way, I would be, as a priest, I'd be looking down and I'd be, say, I'd be thinking, I'm going to let the King of Kings, Lord of Lords, the God of the universe, to examine me whether I've, I'm worthy to do this work for him or not. Is he going to find sin read in my life or not? And if he won't, then, then I am worthy to do this work for him. And then bellows between each one, knowing that God could examine and strike down dead at any point. So I think it would have been a very, a very solemn time of, of self-examination. <clears throat> Getting prepared to meet God in that courtyard, in that holy place. So now... We're going to look at the curtains the, that are on top, and we're going to finally, after four sessions, take some coverings off and look at some more details of the actual tent of meeting. So God instructed, the first one, by the way, the black one that I took off, that's just a, a covering, it says a covering of a badger skins. It just says badger skins, and it calls it a covering. The other ones are called curtains. So my, my belief is that the black one was just a practical covering to keep it protected from the elements. The first one's called a curtain. And again, we see blue, purple, red, and white with cherubim embroidered into the covering. We didn't see them. But everything was covered up. You can't see it from the outside. But if you were to have gone inside and looked up, it would have looked like, just like it says in, in, in Peter 1, receiving the end of your faith, even the salvation of your souls, of which salvation the prophets have inquired and searched diligently, who prophesied of the grace that should come unto you, Searching what or what manner of time the Spirit of Christ, which was in them, did signify when it testified beforehand of the sufferings of Christ and the glory that should follow, unto whom it was revealed that not unto themselves, but unto us they did minister the things which are now reported unto you by them that have preached the gospel unto you with the Holy Ghost sent down from, from heaven. Then it says, which things the angels also desire to look into. So we have the heavenly hosts looking down into that tabernacle and trying to understand God's plan in it. So the first covering that was put on top, I'm not going to put this on perfectly, but I'll just show it for, for the analogy. So the first covering that was put on top of that ark represents or part of the tent again represents God he came to us as prophet blue he came to us as a suffering servant died red he resurrected again from the dead to become an eternal priest white and he will one day come back again as a ruling king purple so we see Jesus in all those colors but then The next covering is put on top. A couple of things about this covering. It just says it's supposed to be goat skins, but the goat skins were to be knitted together with brass. What does brass represent? That's right. So I believe that this represents God having taken upon him humanity that is to be judged. And then that judgment, judgment happens, covered by the blood. That last covering is just called just a ram skin dyed red, specifically ordered by God to be dyed red. And as I was thinking about just last week when I was 
preparing this set of slides, I was thinking about this passage of Scripture. Philippians 2, 6 straight. Who? Jesus, being in the form of God, red, blue, white, uh, purple. Jesus, being in the form of God, he thought it not robbery to be equal with God. Jesus could have stayed in the heaven as the Son of God, as the Word of God, but he made himself of no reputation, right? The goat skins, covered in being judged as a human. He made himself of no reputation. He took upon him the, ser- the, the form of a servant and was made in likeness of men. And being found in the fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became even obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. We have all those God taking on man and then being dead and condemned in that way, in that cross. This outer wall I believe that just like all these posts that are on the outside of the tabernacle court are typifying unsaved humanity, earthly, yes, you know, made to look alive again, but only sustained, and they're judged, and not, no one's worthy to come in except through a high price paid. I believe there are wooden posts and pillars, but the, but the house of God, all the boards around the house of God, the Bible says clearly that they are to be wooden boards, so in a way earthly, but then covered in gold, eternal. So it's the earthly clothed with immortality is what we see with those boards. And what does silver represent? What does silver represent? Children? Children? Silver, silver represents as the word of God is purified seven times, right? So so silver represents the purity of the word of God. So these, these boards, for some reason, God instructed that each one of these boards should be set into two sockets of silver. Not one socket, like both, two sockets of silver. And I was again like, God, there's got to be a reason for this. There's nothing written in Scripture as to why. It just says there's, there's supposed to be two sockets of silver under each one of these boards. And as I thought about the fact that if, if I'm right to say that each of these boards represent God's family, us, the church, being born again, have, having been once earthly but clothed with eternal life, it would also make sense to believe that we shouldn't just have one foot grounded in the Word of God, but both planted firmly in the Word of God. Not one foot into psychology of this world or into the ideal doctrines of even church denominations, but always in everything being grounded firmly in the Word of God. And then it says, every single one of these boards is supposed to be joined fitly together. Ephesians 2, 20 through 22. We are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus him Christ being the chief cornerstone, in whom all the building is fitly framed together, grows unto a holy temple of the Lord, in whom also ye are built together for a habitation of God. So we as a church are supposed to be that beautifully united that to represent God's, God's family and God's, God's place. Now, inside the holy place, only one light source, one candlestick. And that one candlestick, I believe very clearly, Represents Jesus. You know, going a little or, around the, changing my order a bit. In whom was life, and the life was the light of men, 
and the light shines in darkness, and the darkness comprehends it not. Without that light in there, there's no light. And as soon as the light is in, there's, there's no darkness. The darkness has no place to go. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. The same came for a witness to bear witness of the light that all men through him might believe. He was not the light, meaning John the Baptist, but was sent to bear witness of that one. That was the true light which lights every man that comes in, excuse me, into this world. And so all the glory, all the glory in this, in this holy place is only from the one light source. We can say, wow, those walls are so beautiful and so, so much gold, but only because there's a light source. We can say, look at that blue and purple and white, that, that's so radiant, but only because there's a light source. And so we need to always endeavor to get, give all the glory back to where it, it comes from. And that's Jesus, the only one that, that lights our way. The table of shoe bread. So there's a table with a crown around it. And then there was a 12 loaves of bread, again showing that I, I want to be the sustainer of life for all, all my people. In John 6, 35, And Jesus said unto them, I am the bread of life. He that comes to me shall never hunger. He that believeth on me shall never, never thirst. And a very interesting too, thing too, and I didn't have time to look at it deeply, but not only did God give instructions on how to build this model, God also gave a lot of instructions on how this model was supposed to be tr uh, transported from one thing to another, one place to another. Even down to the specifics of what color fabric the different materials were supposed to be covered in. What type of fabric the different pieces of furniture were supposed to be covered in. Jesus said, I am the bread of life. And he also said, I will give my body. Right, This, this bread which is broken from you, which typifies the body of Christ is Jesus giving to us. A picture of Jesus pointing to us. And I thought it was interesting. I thought, I decided to, I wonder what color fabric was used to move the, the table of shoe bread. What color might it be? It was red. Jesus' body having taken upon him, again, the sin of the world. The ark the, the altar the, of the sacrifice. I believe that one was blue or purple. I don't, I'm not sure. I haven't looked into all those yet, but that specific one I did look into. I thought it was very, very beautiful. And then we have the altar of incense right in front of the Holy of Holies. And if anyone's wondering, is that the Monopoly game hat? Yes, it is. Apologize if that's not very reverent, but it was one of those things where I, last minute I forgot to make a piece and there wasn't any instructions given as to what it should be made out of. And I just saw this Monopoly hat and I was like, this works. And I actually, it was the reason, reason for that too was I could, because of that being metal, I could actually put little coals in there and actually cause smoke at some point. Maybe we'll do that too. We have the altar of incense as the last piece that we're going to look at. And this altar, again, it's actually, I'm going to, I forgot to mention one key thing. Going back to the, um, the candlestick and the fact that Jesus is the light and there's no other light. God doesn't share his glory with any other gods. He's one God that rules over all. A lot of the pieces of furniture are, are made out of gold or they're wood covered in gold. But because the candlestick represents Jesus himself, I believe that is why when, when God instructed Moses to build the, the candlestick, 
He said, one solid piece of gold hammered into shape. You know, that shocked me to think of that. Like this, this candlestick there, lampstand, it's named candlestick sometimes, lampstand other times. This lampstand is very basic compared to the description in the Bible. Where it, with its knobs and roses and knobs and different things, it, 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 you can tell, I should have brought up an, a, a couple of other pictures of what it would have actually looked like, but it was a lot more detailed than, than the simple model that, that we 3D printed. And this candlestick or lamp stand would have been big. Like it doesn't tell us in the scriptures how big, it just says that it's supposed to be this, ma- this amount of weight of gold they're supposed to use. And then they're supposed to beat that thing into shape, into the shape of a candlestick. And just made me think of a few things. One is that God's not sharing his glory with other quote-unquote little g gods. It's not many gods being put together, fit together. And God wasn't melted down and reformed into a solid. It was God forming himself into Jesus. So God becoming Christ. And again, it was talking about a, a beaten work, and it was, it was a miracle even that, that man could have been involved in making that. Because they literally would have had a, a chunk of gold and started hammering and shaping, and at some point, you know, have the foot and then come up, and then have one arm come up, and then the second one, the third one, and seven, seven of them across. And then when they get to the seventh, they weren't short or long. It would have just been perfect. So God gifted these men to be able to do that, to be able to hammer that into place. So God, Jesus being one light, one light source in the church, anything that we have to give, it's only because God has given it to us to share with others. It's It's him that that receives back all the honor and all the glory. But the altar of incense, that one specifically it says, make it of wood and cover it with gold again. And I know I'm just trying to grasp and understand why all these things are supposed to be done in that way. But it's the job of the church Because we have been clothed with eternal life, because we have been given eternal life through the gospel, yes, we were once earthly and now clothed in eternal life, and now we're just, you know, praying and giving our glory back up to God and wanting God to to accept our offerings and our gifts to him. It says in Leviticus 4, And the priest shall dip his finger in the blood and sprinkle it, sprinkle it of the, uh, sorry, sprinkle of blood seven times before the Lord, before the veil of the sanctuary. And the priest shall put some of the blood upon the horns of the altar of incense, of the altar of sweet incense before the Lord, which is, which is in the tabernacle, the congregation. So there was this animal sacrifice happening here. And then some of the blood was being carried in and put on the tips of the horns of the altar of incense and then the coals were carrying smoke up into the heavens, right? So I think what God was trying to say is that he wanted us to see that your sins have been atoned for. They've been temporarily covered. And though you might feel guilty, one day that won't happen anymore. But God has accepted that sacrifice. And then when they put the horn, the tip on the horns of the altar of incense, it was again showing that we're trying to show you that God, that the the death has occurred. The death that you expected to happen has properly happened. Please accept. In the same way that when Jesus died and resurrected into heaven, that God counted that as it says in, in Ephesians chapter 5, and walk in love as Christ also has loved us and has given himself for us, an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling savor. So this coal in the altar of incense, the blood being applied, accept the offering, and then the smoke going up, and God counting that 
it's been done in the same way it happened and was finished fully and eternally for all of us on the cross. There was also um, there was also a crown put around. I, I forgot to mention that before. That's okay. I'll, I'll just leave that out. But I think that's it. Oh yeah. Then obviously, on this picture, this was one of the. This was right after we made the model the first time. And we made all those, uh, the curtain there, the veil between the holy place and the holy of holies. We had made it into individual pieces at first. That's why you can see them hanging there kind of individually. When we take the coverings off and you see it now, they're, they're, they're sewn back together <laughs> again. It actually felt a little bit weird doing that because the temple curtain has been torn, right? So this would have been the curtain that would have been in the temple when Jesus would have been crucified. And then it was rent in two that there was now full access to come to God. So before we couldn't, and now we, now we can. <clears throat>